market failure, um, uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, today is sort of a little bit of uh, history of economic thought, I guess. Uh, uh, we'll just give you a little bit of background about the economics of market failure. Those of you who have taken economics, you know, you read through the chapters of a textbook on uh, externalities, public goods, monopoly, all the standard uh, examples of market failure. And there was a huge uh, literature that came up uh, relatively new in, in, the, in the scheme of things, really beginning in the 1930s and 40s, because that's when the, uh, the per so-called perfect competition model was developed. Prior to that, uh, just about anybody who wrote anything about economics and competition and, and industry uh, pretty much followed what the Austrians were saying about competition being a dynamic, rivalrous process of entrepreneurship, uh, sort of, you know, the common sense ideas about what competition is. It involves price cutting and product differentiation and mergers, uh, and, and the markets are constantly dynamic. And, and businesses are constantly changing, changing tactics, changing strategies, changing products, uh, changing prices to see what works best. So the market evolves to tell us what works best, and that's how businesses find out what works best and you know, what price to charge and so forth. But then um, uh, in this sort of the, the uh, crusade to create uh, an economic science and, and the mathematization of economics, it was decided that the old ways of thinking about markets uh, were inadequate. We needed a new theory. So they developed uh, the, the theory of perfect competition. And like I said, in the scheme of things, it's relatively recent. It's you know, 80, 80 or 90 years old as far as that goes in, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the history of economic thought. And so uh, Peter Klein probably talked about some of this. But uh, you know, the, the new, the new uh, uh, definition of competition involved uh, a number of assumptions about what a perfect market would look like. Homogeneous products, homogeneous prices, many firms and costless entry of it and exit. Perfect information was also in there. It's, uh, I'll just call that omniscience. <laughs> so, so all of a sudden, the markets did not change in the 1930s. The markets were markets, you know, they you know, the, the normal ups and downs of markets or the 1940s. But all of a sudden, uh, homogeneous products. Uh, you know, if the, if the New England Patriots adopt a slightly different defense than the Atlanta Falcons, well, that's product <laughs> differentiation. That's an uh, imperfect market in uh, professional football. Or, just, you know, pick your industry. Uh, you have a sale. Uh, well, that's not a homogeneous. You're not charging the same price as everyone else anymore. That's market failure. Uh, costless entry and exit, uh, well, that, that guarantees that uh, the prices will stay uh, at this same level, you know, price equal the minimum of average cost, because if you raise your price one penny, uh, 10,000 firms will costlessly enter immediately and drop the price back down that one penny. And then, of course, you're omniscient. You know exactly how to uh, produce the cost-minimizing uh, uh, combination of inputs, uh, and everything else, uh, consumers know exactly what they want. Uh, and as Friedrich Hayek said in his uh, 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 famous essay, uh, The Meaning of Competition, which is online, uh, he said, under perfect competition, there is no competition. So they pretty much, but so the economics profession, though, took this seriously, took this seriously and made recommendation after recommendation for government regulation of all sorts to, to deal with this uh, this problem all of a sudden that existed that economists didn't think it did exist for you know many generations uh, before that and what that uh, the rubric that uh, that that goes under is the nirvana fallacy nirvana fallacy <clears throat> and the nirvana fallacy is a phrase that I was coined probably it was coined by there's an economist named Harold Demsetz, that's spelled D-E-M-S-E-T-Z. He wrote an article in the Journal of Law and Economics in, uh, I think it was 1969. It was called Information and Efficiency, Another Viewpoint. Um, I found it online at some point, so it's online somewhere. Harold Demsetz. And uh, he was in a debate at the time uh, in the journals with Kenneth Arrow, who was a Nobel Prize winning economist and a famous market failure theorist. 
And uh, the reason he used this phrase, nirvana fallacy, is he's saying that, well, the, the method of analysis of these, these the mainstream economics profession was to set up this unrealistic, uh, unobtainable, uh, utopian ideal called perfect competition, and then compare that to the real world, and then announce that the real world is a failure, and that perfect government uh, must step in and perfectly solve the problem of market failure in, in some way. And so there's sort of double dishonesty there. One is it's a totally a straw man argument, set up a straw man, perfect competition, and look around the world and say, uh, oh, I don't see perfection out there. And then part two is, but I'm looking at, I'm looking at Washington DC in the distance and I see perfection, I see nirvana. You know, I see politicians and bureaucrats, and they will they will perfectly solve the problem, and 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 and, and that's and that's the basically the method of analysis uh, of the market failure theory. And you know, when I was just getting out of graduate school, I mean, when I got out of graduate school, when I started my career, I remember having a colleague at George Mason who was very prolific. He's publishing like mad in all these uh, highly mathematical journals because his dissertation was one big mathematical model of market failure, and he would just add another tiny little different assumption, a slightly different assumption, and then churn through all the math again, and he would get a yet another article in the, the International Review of International Trade or something like this, and he was he, he had like a dozen a year like this. And so if you look at the literature, you think, oh my God, the markets, markets are rotten, they're failure everywhere. But, uh, but, and this was why. And, uh, and that's why, by the way, the whole field of public choice came along to say, uh, now hold on a minute, the governments are not perfect. And they pretty much accepted, they said, they said even if you accept all this market failure literature, then uh, uh, you can't assume the government will make the problem better, it might make it worse. Uh, but that's sort of a, I'm getting off my topic a little bit. And so what I wrote down here, so that's what the nirvana fallacy is. Uh, and, and what I wrote down here is uh, how to make markets fail, quote, fail, or how to declare markets being failing. Nirvana fallacy, step one, ignore the fact that markets are dynamic. So if there's, a, if there's some sort of problem or issue and you don't like how markets are operating, well, give them time. You know, the markets aren't static. They change over time. And I'm going to talk about that in a little more detail. Also, you, you ignore entrepreneurship. Because if there's a, a perceived problem in the market, uh, you know, more often than not, there's money to be made by somebody by solving the problem. Human beings are problem solvers. That's what entrepreneurs do. And, uh, and so, you, but you have, so you have to ignore entrepreneurship too uh, to, to guarantee that markets fail everywhere. And you also have to ignore reality. So a lot of these market failure theories uh, that, have, that have made it into the textbooks are theories. And they're assumed as truth because they're theories. And this is especially true of the, the hyper-mathematical segment of the economics profession uh, that comes from places like MIT and Harvard and Princeton and schools like that, where they, they have the extraordinarily elaborate mathematical models and then not a single statistic or a bit of history or anything. Uh, they just assume that since the mathematical model uh, they solved the mathematical model and got an equilibrium condition that that's God's truth. And that's not always true. Uh, that's not always true uh, about, about, about these models. Uh, I can remember early in my career, I, I wrote a whole book, uh, with sections of a book about the phenomenon of, of that, the fact that uh, in the Congress, something like 90 to 95% of all incumbents uh, are, have been reelected for the past 60 years. That's a true fact, okay? I was at a meeting of the Public Choice Society and a mathematical political scientist uh, was there and he had this a very impressive looking mathematical model and the conclusion of it was that incumbents will never be reelected. The, the government was perfectly competitive. And, then, and, and he was kind of laughing at me when I, when I threw up these stati the real statistics, he's kind of giggling that, uh, about, about this and you know, what planet am I living on? If, if it's, you know. You know, you have a choice, reality and BS. Oh, I'll pick the BS. Uh, uh, it's better for my career to pick the BS. Uh, so, so, uh, so what do I mean by all this? Well, the, uh, an example, I'll give you one sh quick example of the Nirvana fallacy in, uh, in microeconomics. 
that used to exist, uh, not so much anymore. Yeah, it's on there. So. This is uh, the the old uh, monopoly diagram from the textbooks, the marginal cost. You know, the, the monopoly model says a monopolist will chart, equate marginal revenue and marginal cost, produce QM, and charge PM as a price, whereas this would be the competitive price, and this would be the competitive uh, output, QC, on there, because the, the marginal cost curve would be the supply curve, and here's demand right here, and that so that would be the price. And so uh, for years... There were economists uh, criticizing uh, product innovation and research and development and urging more government regulation and control of R&D and innovation because they thought it was leading to monopoly. It was sort of that sort of thinking that led to the uh, antitrust lawsuit against Microsoft. When was it, 15 or so years ago? But the argument they were making was that if you invent a new product, <clears throat> you're, by definition, you're creating a monopoly, at least temporarily, before anybody gets there. And so you're restricting output. And so the standard analysis was that, uh, well, that we should be uh, uh, leery of this, they're creating monopolies because the, the output restriction is said to be this, this amount here, you know, a, comp a perfectly competitive market. If everybody had the same idea at the same time, then the market equilib equilibrium would be QC right here. <laughs> but they didn't, you did, you had the idea and now you're a monopolist and you're producing QM. And so, therefore, perhaps we should force Microsoft to share the the, uh, uh, the code for Windows. That that was a proposal that the government made back when they were suing Microsoft. You know, publish that, or maybe we should force Coca-Cola to publish the recipe for Coca-Cola or the Kentucky Fried Chicken recipe. You know, it's unfair that Colonel Sanders hogs it all, the uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken recipe. But uh, what Harold Demsett s said. And, uh, and would, st would still say, still around, is that the appropriate comparison is the existing world today, which is right here, zero, to the existing world after your invention, which is QM. So by inventing the product, you have actually expanded outputs, or expanded production. You haven't restricted production. Because, of course, if you, if you compare Nirvana, perfectly competitive equilibrium, QC, to something less, well, yeah, you denounce it as failure. But the real comparison is what we have today versus what we have tomorrow after your invention gets on the market. That's the real, the real comparison. And so you know, to put aside the fact that the whole idea of output restriction is a bad thing, uh, as, as Murray Rothbard pointed out in uh, Man, Economy, and State, that <clears throat> even assuming that one industry does restrict output like this, well, all those resources don't just disappear. They're put to work somewhere else. And so there's going to be an expansion of output somewhere else. So you cannot say that there's been an output restriction in a global sense because you know, the economy is fluid and dynamic. Okay, so that's one example of the Nirvana fallacy. And so what I thought I'd do is give you some talk about some of the economics literature on market failure that I think illustrates uh, what I just said here. It illustrates uh, how to declare markets failing, I'm gonna put that back up on the, on the screen now, by a combination of all these things, the Nirvana fallacy, ignoring the fact that markets are dynamic, ignoring entrepreneurship, and ignoring reality, okay? Uh, one example, um, there's an, an article by uh, Ronald Coase, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in economics some years ago. He, he was never considered to be an Austrian economist, uh, although, uh, a lot of his research, and he was around a long time, I, I've, re I've read articles by Ronald Coase that he published in the 1930s, and he was still, 10 years ago, he was still uh, publishing um, articles. And so, uh, right, shortly before he died, I think he lived to 105 or something like that, he lived a good long life. And, uh, and it would have been consistent with a lot of research in, in, in Austrian economics, and it would have been... Uh, I'm pretty sure it would have been welcomed in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, some of, the, some of the things that he wrote. He was the editor of the Journal of Law and Economics for many years. Anyway, uh, he took on this idea that in all the textbooks for, uh, for many, many years, when they get to the section on uh, the free rider problem and the public goods problem, uh, and it's time to name an example, they would name the lighthouse as an example. The lighthouse would be an example. Here's what... Uh, 
Paul Samuelson said in his famous textbook, take our earlier case of a lighthouse to warn against the rocks, you know, the ships, warning the ships against the rocks in the, in the bay. Its beam helps everyone in sight, but a businessman could not build it for a profit since he cannot claim a price from each user. This certainly is the kind of activity that governments would naturally undertake. So there's, so he, and he, had, he goes on and he gives a much more detailed explanation of why this is a classic example of the free rider problem that uh, you, know, you can't charge the next ship coming in the harbor for the light. Once the light is provided, the, uh, the next ship to come along will just free ride on whoever paid for the light. And therefore, in advance, you can never get the, uh, the merchants, the shippers, to pay for a lighthouse because of the free riding problem. They would all be motivated to say, let George do it. Let the other guy pay for it. I'm not going to pay. And, uh, and if everybody thinks that way, then you end up not getting the, the, the so-called public good provided. Classic free rider problem. Well, Coase did something. You know, he, he, he quotes Paul Samuel, the, you know, the great Paul Samuelson. Well, I think Samuelson won the first Nobel Prize in economics. He quotes Arthur Pigou. Uh, you know, the, his name is also associated with the theory of externalities on this. And other, you know, famous economists in the history of economic thought is saying the same thing. And none of these great scholars did what Coase did. Coase got up off, off his butt and out of his swivel chair in his faculty office, and they went to the library. Imagine that. Imagine an economic theorist going to the library, and he read some books about lighthouses. You know, what a, what a pedestrian thing for, for a PhD to be doing, reading books. And, uh, and lo and behold, he, he studied the, um, the British lighthouse system and found that for many generations, there had been privately funded lighthouses. So that those the the shipping industry was not so stupid after all as Paul Samuelson thought, you know it's kind of like, uh, and, and so uh, and so I'm not going to tell you the whole story. So he did this big long study with you know big lengthy quotations and all that, but he found out that uh, it did exist. Okay, that uh, the, the the story told by the the market failure theories did not. Uh, match reality. And then he concludes by saying this, the question remains, how is it that these great men have in their economic writings been led to make statements about lighthouses, which are misleading as to the facts, whose meaning of thought about in a concrete fashion is quite unclear, and which to the extent that they imply a policy conclusion are very likely wrong. And he goes on to say, the explanation is that these references by economists to lighthouses are not the result of their having made a study of lighthouses or having read a detailed study by some other economist. Despite the extensive use of the lighthouse example in the economics literature, no economist, to my knowledge, has ever made a comprehensive study of lighthouse finance and administration. The lighthouse is simply plucked out of the air to serve as an illustration. And you see that all the time in, in economics literature. And like I said, it's especially the, the math-obsessed model builders. Uh, they, they exhaust themselves uh, with building these uh, ma mathematical models. And then uh, apparently they're too tired to pick up a book and, and see if reality matches the conclusion of their model, uh, or at least go online in, in nowadays. And one of, my, one of the first book reviews I ever published uh, when I got out of graduate school was in the Southern Economic Journal, and it was a book on innovation, on technological innovation. And one chapter had 57 equations, a model with 57 equations, uh, to come to the conclusion that the higher the expected return on an investment, the more money a corporation will want to put behind that investment. <laughs> and I, I published that in, in, the, in the Southern Economic Journal, because that's, that's a, a direct quote. And it took 57 equations to come to that conclusion. Okay, that's the lighthouse. Another good example, a famous example in the, in the literature, is called the fable of the bees. And, and again, this is another example of uh, uh, market failure that was uh, in, in almost all the microeconomics textbooks. And it's a situation of where uh, uh, you have a phenomenon of an apple orchard and uh, bees, and bees could pollinate the apple trees so that the apple orchard owner will get more apples. And also, when the bees pollinate the apple trees, the bees get nourishment, and so you, the beekeeper will get more honey. So there's sort of a reciprocal positive externality there. 
And for, for years and years and years, this was given as, as an example in the textbooks of market failure uh, under the assumption, the assumption that there's no way that there would be any sort of uh, payment for uh, of the beekeepers to have their bees near the apple orchard at uh, at the time when the blossoms come out, and or or the apple orchard owner wouldn't uh, uh, you know they wouldn't get together in any way and figure out uh, how to benefit from this, and so therefore they these people said that there's a need for government intervention to subsidize beekeeping. Okay, and I'll read you one thing here, and once again another economist named Stephen Chung. It was from Hong Kong, and he was teaching at the University of Washington in Seattle at the time. And if you went to the nearest grocery store here in Auburn and bought apples this afternoon, you'd probably find some from Washington State, the big apple-growing state. And so he was right there in the middle of it, and he also did the unthinkable. He got up off his butt and went to the library. Not only that, he went and interviewed beekeepers and apple orchard owners. Imagine that. I mean, you know, with, you know, he went to school all those years to do to do that. You're supposed to sit in your office and play with math, as, uh, as if you're an economist. And so, here's uh, so Stephen Chung uh, quotes uh, some other famous economists. Uh, Francis Bator, uh, he wrote the book on market failure in, in the 1950s. If you if you went to graduate school in the 1950s and 60s and took uh, a course in public finance, you 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 read. Francis Bator's book on market failure. He said this, it's easy to show that if apple blossoms have a positive effect on honey production, any Pareto efficient solution will associate with apple blossoms a positive Lagrangian shadow price. That's some math econ lingo, don't, don't worry about it. If then apple producers are unable to protect their equity in apple nectar and markets do not impute to apple blossoms their correct shadow value, Profit maximizing decisions will fall will fail correctly to allocate resources. Aha, uh -huh, market failure. At the margin. There will be failure by enforcement. This is what I would call an ownership externality. So we invented a new type of externality, an ownership externality. Uh, there's no way that they could uh, find out some financial arrangement to have the bees close to the apple orchard and uh, um, so that both could benefit. And Stephen Chung uh, and Coase sort of thought like an Austrian would think who has been studying entrepreneurship. It seems to me there's money to be made here. You know, the bees, the bee, uh, the bee uh, keepers can make more money with more, more honey, and the apple orchard owner can make more money if uh, he has bees pollinating his apple trees. And it's, it's as though there's a $10,000 sitting here on this chair today, and it's also here by Sunday and nobody picks it up. I'm not saying that you guys are a bunch of thieves that would pick the money up, but, but uh, there's a clear profit opportunity here, and the assumption is uh, entrepreneurs are kind of dumb. They're just going to leave it there. and they, you know, they need us, us economists who are sitting on our butts in our offices at MIT to, to, to tell them how, uh, how to organize their industry. Well, Stephen Chung, like I said, did the unheard of, and he actually became an expert in beekeeping and apple orchard running and he found that for many generations, the beekeepers and the apple orchard owners had written contracts specifying how much the beekeeper is to be paid, when the bees are to be there. Uh, when, when the apple orchard owner puts pesticides on his trees, he gives two weeks notice to the beekeeper to get the bees out of there so they're not harmed by the pesticides and so forth. I'll read you one little thing. He says, this contracts between beekeepers and farmers may be oral or written. I have at hand two types of written contracts. One is formally printed by an association of beekeepers. So the trade association of beekeepers actually had uh, form letters for the, this is you want to make a contract with an apple orchard owner here it is here, here's what here's what our lawyers prefer uh, advise you to to use use this contract uh, with a few printed headings and space for stipulations to be filled in by hand. Aside from situations where a third party demands documented proof of the contract. Written contracts are used primarily for the initial arrangement between the parties. Otherwise, oral arrangements are made. And so that, that basically uh, is a summary of what he found. And then uh, in the concluding paragraph of Stephen Chung's article, which was also published in the Journal of Law and Economics, uh, he says uh, the problem here, he says, is that some economists have been distilling their policy implications from fables. 
In a desire to promote government intervention, they have been prone to advance, without the support of careful investigation, the notion of, quote, market failure. And how do they do that? He says they do it by, quote, comparing the ideal with a fable. Uh, Nirvana fallacy, comparing the ideal with, 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 a, with a fable. And he says, my main criticism concerns their approach to economic inquiry and failing to investigate the real world situation. So that's ignoring reality. That's my point number four there. And also ignoring entrepreneurship. You know, the, the beekeepers and the apple orchard owners are very entrepreneurial in figuring out a long time ago how to wring every last penny out of, out of their investments in beekeeping and apple orchard owning. Okay. There's another, another interesting article in this literature and, uh, by Steve Margolis, uh, forget his co-author now, I shouldn't. Uh, Steve Margolis and Stan Leibowitz, entitled Fable of the Keys. Not Fable of the Bees, Fable of the Keys. Who knows what that is? That's the, the configuration of the keyboard. Yeah, well, the, there was a, an article published in the economics literature by an economist named Paul David uh, uh, that argued that this is yet another case of market failure uh, because in the story that he told in his article was that there is a, a different type of keyboard, this. That's not the configuration of letters. That's a man's name, Dvorak, um, that is superior. And, and so he, 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 he invented a new t type of uh, market failure, path dependence. He said that, that there are certain types of technologies that are adopted for whatever reason that are inferior technologies. And so we go down this path and we, and we lock in inferior technologies. And as his example, he used the QWERTY keyboard because uh, he argued that the, uh, the Dvorak keyboard that was developed in the 1940s it, he said was clearly superior to QWERTY, but uh, for whatever reason, the QWERTY got there five minutes earlier, uh, you know, whatever the reason, it became adopted, and so we're locked into inferior technology. So another fault of the free market is that it locks in inferior technology. And uh, I'm working on, a, I'm planning on writing a paper on this subject now, and I'm collecting information on government uh, locked in inferior technology. And my best example so far is that the U.S. Uh, nuclear arsenal still uses 1970s era eight-inch floppy disks. <laughs> you can Google it; you'll find you'll find articles on it. The General Services Administration did a big study, and you read this, and you're like, "Holy cow! The nuclear arsenal is running on, on outdated eight. You know, they even did away with these eight-inch disks and went to four-inch disks at some point in the floppy disk. But, but anyway, I'm, I'm getting a little uh, uh, away from myself. The fable of the keys. Well, anyway, Stan Leibowitz and, uh, and Steve Margolis uh, did yet again uh, the unheard of and did not rely just on theory. And they didn't really, didn't really buy the argument that... Uh, that consumers for decades and decades would be satisfied with an inferior technology or that some entrepreneur wouldn't take this Dvorak keyboard and market it and convince people and improve it and, and persuade people that this is a competitive product. And so, and not every typewriter, this was back before uh, computers, personal computers, uh, should have the QWERTY keyboard. Well, anyway, what they found out was, uh, and I'll read you some of this, uh, He's not good. And when they looked into it, they found they, they wanted to find out, well, well, where did this Dvorak keyboard come from? Anyway, who made it? Who's new? And so they found a bunch of U.S. Navy studies that were done during World War II uh, claiming that the Dvorak keyboard was superior to uh, the QWERTY keyboard. And that was the evidence that Paul David, in his article, put. And here's what Leibowitz and Margolis uh, write about this. He said, Earl Strong, a professor at Pennsylvania State University and a one-time champion, chair, champion, chairman of the office machine section of the American Standards Association, reports that the 1944 U.S. Navy experiment 
and some Treasury Department experiments performed in 1946 were conducted by a Dr. Dvorak, who owned the patent for the keyboard of the Dvorak system and received at least $130,000 from the Carnegie Commission for Education for the studies performed while he was at the University of Washington. And so it's as though Chrysler did studies of cars comparing Chrysler's with Toyota's and, uh, and said, we have a series of 10 studies that proves Chrysler's are better than Toyota's. And, uh, and that's, what, that's what Dvorak did. So that does, well, that doesn't prove that uh, the QWERTY keyboard is uh, not inferior to the Dvorak keyboard, but it raises some big red flags, doesn't it? There's a conflict of interest here. And so they kept digging. And uh, you know, I love this kind of research. This is, you know, it's guided by economic theory. And it's, and it's reality, and, and it's hard work, it's history, and it's, it's, and it's a study of reality, and it's much, uh, much more convincing than uh, uh, the MIT version of economics, where you sit in a room doing math all day. Not that there's anything wrong inherently with math, but sometimes you have to look outside the window, uh, too. Anyway, they found a whole bunch of 1956 General Service Administration studies that did not support the Dvorak keyboard. And so they took a step further and they, they got a grant and hired their own experts to, uh, to do ergonomic experiments. And they, and they ended up uh, concluding, the experts did, that the QWERTY keyboard is marginally better mar in terms of you know, words per minute typed with no mistakes. Uh, it's, yeah, not, not much, but not much. But for whatever, whatever reason, the consumers liked it. And so, uh, so once again, they went, they went a little too fast in condemning uh, markets by some combination of the nirvana fallacy, ignoring entrepreneurship, ignoring reality uh, out there. Uh, private roads. Uh, uh, Walter Block is not here this year, so uh, you're, you're spared uh, the words of our famous Rhodes scholar, uh, Walter. <laughs> Is, uh, <laughs> he's been making the case for private roads for about 50 years now. But uh, the original case for private roads, uh, as far as I know, or not for, for government subsidies for roads, one, probably the original case was made by Alexander Hamilton himself. He called it uh, internal improvement subsidy. In my book on Hamilton, Hamilton's Curse, I quote him himself uh, saying this, saying a, a pretty pretty good rendition of the free rider problem at the time, uh, <coughs> that uh, he thought that private funding will not be sufficient for, for road building. Uh, and then that Thomas Jefferson's treasure, Treasury Secretary, after Hamilton left and George Washington was out of office, he was an advocate of government subsidies for road building for the same reason they thought the, a free rider problem. So they both expressed the free rider problem long before there were any textbooks written uh, in explaining the free rider problem. Okay, but at the same time, uh, private corporations were busy building private roads in, uh, all over the country. Let's see, I'll give you another, another example here. And here's, I'm going to read you one short passage. There's an article that was in a journal called Economic Inquiry, which is a pretty high-level journal, pretty good economics journal by Daniel Klein. And, uh, and Danny Klein was an undergraduate student of mine at George Mason 100 years ago. I lost track of him now. I don't know where he's, where he's at now. He taught in California for a while, and I lost pat, uh, track of him. So he's, he's familiar with Austrian economics. Uh, he was part of the early, the very beginnings of the, uh, they used to call it the Center for Study of Market Processes at George Mason, and now it's the Mercatus Center, I guess. I don't, think, I don't know if they even have that na same name anymore. But anyway, he did a study of uh, the building of roads in early America. When we're talking the late 18th century, early 19th century. And here's some of the things he found. And again, he found a whole bunch of books that it, of historians who had studied this. Imagine that. Imagine that. They had, they, they, an economist who, once again, reads books. Unbelievable. Some years ago, by the way, let me diverge, let me uh, sidetrack myself again. My... Uh, my university would give the, every freshman a book to read for freshman orientation. And it was the, the business school's turn to choose the book. And the economics department chairman asked me to be on the committee to choose the book. 
because she told me, you're the only member of the department who reads books. <laughs> it's a true story. It's a true story. That's what the economics department is like. Um, so naturally, I was on the committee to pick a book, because no one else would have any idea what book to, to pick. They don't read books. Yeah. But Danny Klein apparently read some books. And here's what he said. Between 1794 and 1840, 238 private New England turnpike companies built and operated 3,750 miles of roads. New York led all over states in turnpike mileage with over 4,000 as of 1821. Pennsylvania was second, reaching a peak of 2,400 miles in 1832. New Jersey companies operated 550 miles by 1821. Maryland's operated 300 miles of private road by, in 1830. Turnpikes also represented a great improvement in road quality. And so, so they did build private roads in early America. And this was about the same time that Hamilton is saying, oh, we need government funding for the roads where we have no roads. Uh, and, and meanwhile, uh, uh, b private businesses are doing it. And, uh, and Dan Klein uh, uh, offers some good explanations of how this happens. He said that these turnpike companies were only paying about a 3% return, and you might have been able to get a 10% return on your money somewhere else, not necessarily even in the United States, in England or someplace. But people invested anyway because they knew that uh, the road would uh, strengthen their community. It would be good for their business. If you had a business and you're, you were connected to the next town over, it would widen your markets. You'd have a bigger market for, for things. And, uh, and, and there was a lot of social ostracism. People who did not invest were sort of socially ostracized or, ostracized or they wouldn't do business with you. And so in small communities like that, uh, these sort of tools were used to get people to invest. And, uh, and it, a lot of people thought it was just in their self-interest to invest in these turnpike companies, uh, especially uh, if it led to greater prosperity for their community, which it did, which it did. And so that's another example, I think, that I would point out of uh, being a little too anxious to condemn markets for failing uh, be, because of the free rider problem uh, without looking at history. Other examples... Uh, you know, well, I, I published an article years ago called The Myth of Natural Monopoly. And it's been translated into a bunch of different languages. I've had people all over the world contact me over the years to, to reprint this, this article on The Myth of Natural Monopoly. And, uh, and the story, you know, that we're usually told is that, uh, uh, and it's usually told in a historical context to American college students, that in the, in the late 19th, early 20th century, there was the advent of these industries that had heavy fixed cost, like the steel industry, natural gas, water supply, and so forth, telephone. And so as a result of that, they had economies of scale. And economies of scale uh, were leading to a situation, supposedly, where one big company would, would uh, achieve very low average cost of production, and that would price everybody out of the market. So there would be a natural monopoly of whichever company got there first with this big large scale production of whatever it was, water supply, uh, you know, telephone services and, and so forth. And therefore, uh, government came in and regulated them in the public interest by doing two things. One, making it legally a monopoly because they wanted the low cost, which the monopoly would give them, but then regulating the price so that it wouldn't be a monopoly price. It would be a that let them make a profit, but not a monopoly profit. And so that's the public interest theory of regulation. Okay. Well, turns out that's another hoax that that never actually happened. And I'll quote Harold Demsetz again. He looked into it. It sounded fishy to him, apparently, at some point. And in his book, Efficiency, Competition, and Public Policy, a collection of his journal articles, he says this, Six electric light companies were organized, were organized in the one year of 1887 in New York City. Forty-five electric light enterprises had the legal right to operate in Chicago in 1907. Prior to 1895, Duluth, Minnesota had five electric lighting companies. Scranton, Pennsylvania had four in 1906. During the latter part of the 19th century, competition was the usual situation in the gas industry in this country, meaning natural gas, I guess. Before 1884, six competing companies were operating in New York City. Competition was common and especially persistent in the telephone industry. Baltimore, Chicago, Cleveland, Columbus, Detroit, Kansas City, Minneapolis, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, St. Louis had at least two telephone services in 1905. 
So it never happened that way. It never, it never happened. This, this natural monopoly never evolved into a natural monopoly. And in my article, I looked into it in a lot, in a lot more detail than just that and, and found that when, when monopoly did occur, uh, the, the, uh, the classic example would be what happened in Maryland. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, elect the Baltimore Gas and, Gas and Light Company uh, tried to merge with a couple of other companies and, uh, and create a monopoly. It didn't work. Uh, you know, mergers didn't work. Uh, too much cheating. Over and over again, they tried it. didn't work. And so they did what corporations always do when they're trying to achieve a monopoly. They go to the state to get the state, uh, the government, to, uh, to give them a monopoly. And so they did. And so they went to the state of Maryland and uh, they, they, they had them pass a law that said that uh, the state of Maryland would share in the loot that they would get. Now, let me, I'll give you the exact numbers here in a second. Uh, I'll tell you how much, how much loot they shared. The, uh, from the Consolidated Gas Company, it was called. Uh, an annual payment to the city of $10,000 a year. This is in 1890, $10,000 a year. That's a couple hundred grand anyway. Uh, and 3% of all dividends declared in return for the privilege of enjoying a 25-year monopoly. So that's how natural monopoly came to Maryland. And then once they did that, uh, other cities all over the country thought, well, that's, that's a good way to sort of sneak in a tax increase, but, you know, raise the electric bill for everybody or the gas bill, and, uh, and uh, the consumers will probably blame the gas company. They won't blame the politicians for that. So it was basically a share-the-loot monopoly scheme, and that's how, that's how the natural monopolies came into being. Uh, I, I cite, there's an article, an article, an economist named Walter Primo, spelled P-R-I-M-E-A-U-X, um, and he spent his, a big part of his career doing statistical studies of uh, the electric power industry. And he wrote a whole book called uh, Direct Utility Competition. And he found out, and this is another guy that got up off, off his swivel chair, he found out that there are dozens of American cities that never did this, and never went this route, that always allowed direct competition. I um, mean, not, not like you, you have a monopoly in the east side of town and you have a monopoly in the west side of town. <laughs> Direct competition for all parts of town by multiple companies. And sure enough, what did he find in the electric power business? That there were lower prices, better service, uh, et cetera, everything you would expect from just a little bit of competition. And, and they also uh, figured out how to minimize the power lines and all that sort of thing. Uh, to, to create minimal, you know, including burying them in some, in some places. And so that, that's sort of a counterexample to the standard story. But for some reason, the textbooks still ignore all this. They ignore Walter Primo to, to their shame to, of the textbooks because this was a... And I remember in graduate school reading uh, these articles of his in the Review of Economics and Statistics and Econometrica. And, and I mean, this was a, a, a big-time, you know, well-known... Uh, empirical economists who, who did these studies in the mainstream, but it's ignored because I guess it's too politically incorrect uh, to do that. And uh, that's my story for now. I guess uh, I guess we have one minute in case anybody wants to make a, a brilliant declaration or throw a tomato or anything like that or howl like a wolf one more time. Uh, uh, if not, uh, okay. What's that? Oh, the, the book I recommended, recommended to the committee? Well, this is a book, you know, it was a business school's choice. And so uh, I couldn't recommend uh, an economic theory book because it's the whole, everybody. It's all the freshman class, music majors, everybody. So I picked a book on uh, the history of entrepreneurship by John Steele Gordon. And I thought at least get them read stories of famous uh, entrepreneurs, uh, and how they, you know, what they did in their lives and things. And it was a pretty good, very readable. Anybody could read it. You didn't have to know any economic theory or anything like that. And I knew that they wouldn't accept something like that. But the, the two left-wingers on the committee threw a fit because it was mostly white males, they told me. <laughs> there, there weren't enough, uh, and they were both women, the two lefties. In the, in the, and so, and, um, but I, I tried to tell them, well, that's real American history. I mean, that's the truth about American, American history. It's not, it's not the truth as much today as it was 150 years ago. But, and it wasn't exclusively males. It went up to pretty modern times. And there were, there were uh, female entrepreneurs in there. But 
a minority because that's the reality. And but uh, but really, they wanted some some big lefty book like uh, nickel and dimed or something like that. And so the university actually had to intervene. The administration had to intervene and and pick some uh, some administrator to pick the book. And he picked some some New York Times commie, uh, some book by some New York Times commie to about international trade, about about why we need NAFTA, or so as I recall, and, and that's, so that's the one they picked. I guess we're out of time. It's it's quarter of, and that's uh, uh, feel free to howl instead of clap if you want. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.